Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, give it a minute or so, and then we will get started. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to our third session. Hope that you had some kind of a pleasant break last Sunday. Remind you again that we skip next Sunday and reconvene on November 7th for the um, session on Jewish prayer. Today, I'd like us to try to wrap up the historical survey of Judaism. And uh, we got a little bit uh, overly engaged in the rabbinic period last time and did not get to touch on um, the sequel, which we call the medieval period uh, in Judaism. I'd like to say a few words about that today as we then move forward towards uh, modernity uh, and begin to understand how Judaism came to be, what we understand it and live it as in. Um, today's society. Um, when we studied about the biblical period, I uh, indicated that this was a foundational period of Judaism. Um, Judaism grounds itself in the text that we know as the Bible in Western uh, culture, as the Tanakh, the uh, Torah, prophets and writings, anthology uh, in the Jewish tradition. Uh, that's a hefty period of time uh, when a lot of different uh, aspects of the early stages of what would become Judaism uh, established themselves. Then comes the period that I'd like to call the formation period. The biblical is foundational. The next period is the form formative or formational period of Judaism. And that often goes by the name of rabbinic or Talmudic Judaism, as Judaism moves uh, from being centered primarily in the land of Israel and a temple-based religion to becoming now a portable religion uh, with the development of the synagogue and a new model of teachers known as the rabbis. There were no rabbis in the biblical period. Uh, the rabbinic tradition believes that the Torah is a text that we do not take literally. We do not always take it at face value. We take it seriously. And that seriousness with which we take it requires <clears throat> interpretation and application. So the rabbinic tradition uh, expands on the written Torah, uh, the text of the Bible, primarily the five books uh, known as the uh, five books of Moses, uh, uh, the Torah, and the other parts of the Bible, and expands it through interpretation. The process of interpretation is called Midrash, and it yields different types of uh, approaches to the text, some legal or halakha, and some narrative, anecdotal, philosophical, moralistic, that's what we call agada. All of this tradition that evolves from the teachings of the rabbis takes us from somewhere in the second century before the common era till about the sixth, seventh century of the common era when the Talmud is consolidated and, uh, and closed. And then a period of interpretation of the Talmudic and, uh, and rabbinic tradition continues. And that's how we enter into the Middle Ages. Uh, the Middle Ages, for purposes of just getting a grasp on the chronology, uh, we can take from the year 
uh, from the 8th century, 7th, 8th century, on to the middle of the 18th century. Uh, we will discuss that a little bit later, but the birth of the Enlightenment and the birth of democracy, what we call modernity. Uh, before I move on to say a few words, I'm going to keep it brief on the Middle Ages. Does anybody have a question or need a clarification on what we have said so far? Trying to present the unfolding of Judaism as a historical religion. It's not just ideas and not just beliefs, not just practices, but these happen in a context. And we are part of that ongoing context. Any questions, any comments, any clarifications? I hope that you're watching the videos from uh, last year's sessions and uh, taking a look at the handouts that accompany those videos for further uh, depth. Okay, hearing no objections or questions, uh, feel free at any time to uh, raise a hand or indicate that you wanna say something. Emily, I see a hand there. Do you wanna ask a question? Oh no, did I accidentally have a thing on? I didn't mean to. There's a little uh, hand showing there. I don't know if you were just waving at me or, or wanted to say something. Okay. Medieval period. When we talk about the middle ages uh, in history, we conjure a period of darkness. Sometimes they're taught as the dark ages in Western history, right? That, term is not applicable because actually the Middle Ages were a very productive period. And I like to think of it as the period of crystallization of the Jewish tradition. Out of the teachings of rabbinic Judaism begins now to emerge a crystallization. And it's by no means uh, uniform or homogeneous. There are many different expressions. Uh, the Middle Ages will see the flowering of philosophy. It'll see the flowering of uh, mysticism. It'll see the flowering of uh, the consolidation of the liturgical traditions in Judaism. It will see uh, on the other side also a lot of pain, a lot of persecution, a lot of expulsions of Jews from different parts of the world, uh, accusations of uh, different uh, um, libels against the Jewish community in different parts of, Jew of Europe, especially that trigger expulsions. So this is a period of consolidation of the traditions of rabbinic Judaism. Uh, they, um, the writings of the Talmud and the rabbinic teachings begin to be, uh, to be studied and, uh, and transmitted and analyzed. And eventually as communities disperse, there is the need to, to consolidate and to make these teachings more accessible. So codes of Jewish law, uh, we can think of a code as an anthology of the most important teachings and traditions uh, concerning primarily halakha, Jewish law. And when we say law, we're not just talking about civil law or criminal law, we're talking about ritual practice, observance, life cycle traditions. How do you, when we say halakha, we mean the practical side of Judaism, the lived outside. When we say agada, uh, that's the other interpretive tradition. We're talking more about the anecdotal, the moralistic, the historical reflection, and eventually, as we will see in the Middle Ages, a whole new body of philosophy. During the Middle Ages, Judaism lives, <clears throat> or the Jewish people live in either the world of Christendom or the world of the new emergent religion, Islam, uh, which arises in the seventh century with the uh, uh, birth and, and mission of Muhammad in Saudi Arabia, but then spreads very quickly throughout <clears throat> the Middle East and into Europe um, and uh, reaches Jewish communities wherever they are settled. And of course, part of that history of the Middle Ages is the conflict between Christianity and Islam, uh, both for territory and for uh, religious and culture, cultural hegemony. And we see this played out especially in Spain. Spain um, had had a Jewish population that probably goes back to the Roman period, uh, if not before. 
And then it was, uh, of course, a Christian country. The Jews were already in Spain when the Visigothic kings uh, begin to, uh, to take over the land and impose, in fact, significant anti-Jewish practices and uh, legislation. It is considered by many scholars that the famous prayer we recite on Yom Kippur evening, the Kol Nidre, emerged among the Jews of Spain during the Visigothic period. Uh, and the Kol Nidre is a prayer that asks for forgiveness for promises made that we cannot keep. So what might those promises be? And uh, one of the uh, possibilities that connects with Kol Nidre is the pledge of Jews under force to convert to Christianity, and yet they continue to observe secret Jewish practices. So the Kol Nidre, uh, if it in fact emanates during this period, was a prayer seeking forgiveness for vowing publicly something that you cannot in good conscience live out privately, but you do it for purposes of preservation of life, of individual and of community. And we see that that's a, an important principle in Jewish life. Um, so in Spain, as the conflict between the Muslims and the Christian church unfolds in the territory of the Iberian Peninsula, Jews who are there, who are there find themselves bouncing back and forth, uh, seeking refuge in either the Muslim or the Christian territories uh, and contributing intellectually in some times and places to what is the greatest cultural um, intellectual ferment of um, many of any other period in history or of many other periods in history, kind of a pre-Renaissance Renaissance takes place in Spain during the uh, <clears throat> period of the ninth through the 14th, 13th century, where Christianity, Judaism, and Islam live in a mixture, sometimes congenial and convivial, sometimes very conflictual, but science, uh, early science begins to flourish. Philological studies, the study of language, uh, the study of law, the study of uh, astronomy, the flourishing of philosophic theology. And it is in Spain that we see the birth of a great Jewish intellectual tradition among the Jews who live there. Uh, the, we give the name to the Jews of Spain, Sephardic Jews, because the biblical word for that area is, or the word that we associate with the, with the biblical term Sephardad is uh, associated with the Jews of that area when the Jews would be expelled from Spain in 1492 and dispersed throughout North Africa, the Ottoman Empire, different European countries, and then eventually to the Americas, these are the Sephardic Jews. To be a Sephardic Jew means to be able to trace your background to the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, and then expelled from there. They settled in many countries and their culture was so high that they influenced the, the, uh, the style of Judaism in these countries. And many of the local communities who already lived in these countries, for example, in the Arab world, then began to identify as Sephardic, even though genealogically and historically, they were not Sephardic, uh, if, we, if we wanna take the term <clears throat> as a term of origins, rather than just a term of culture. So in Spain, we see the flourishing of great Jewish thinkers, of biblical interpretation, of grammar, of, uh, of philosophy. And the greatest exponent of Spanish philosophy, and many regard him as the, one of the greatest intellects of Judaism uh, for all times, but Einstein is to science and Freud is to psychology. Moses Maimonides is to Jewish philosophy and theology. Maimonides, Maimonides uh, lived in, uh, in, in Spain in the city of Cordova in the 12th, 13th century. He, was, he eventually left and settled in Egypt in the city of Fez. He was an advisor to the Sultan uh, in Egypt. And uh, he was a physician, he was an astronomer, he was a, uh, a 
biblical and Talmudic commentator. And his writings set the tone for what would become Orthodox Judaism, uh, not only in the Sephardic world, but significantly by his influence in what will become the Ashkenazi world as well. The two greatest work of, works of Moses Maimonides, and he wrote about everything. He wrote about medicine, he wrote about astronomy, he wrote about uh, 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 language, he wrote about uh, uh, law. But his two greatest works for purposes of Jewish tradition are what is known as the Mishneh Torah, or the repetition or um, analysis of the Torah, the Mishneh, the the rehashing, you can say, the rehashing, the restudy of the Torah, also known as the Yad Ahazaka, the strong hand, because the Hebrew word for Yad, which means hand, also symbolizes the number 14, and there are 14 volumes to his Mishneh Torah. And this is a legal exposition of Judaism. It sets the foundations for Jewish practice, and in significant ways, Jewish uh, belief, what will become Jewish belief. So Maimonides was in the position of having to explicate not only Jewish practice, but Jewish belief, because he lived in the midst of Islam and Christianity, both of which claimed to be the rightful inheritors of the biblical tradition. So Christianity considered itself to be the rightful inher inheritor of the biblical tradition. Islam considered itself to be the, the, the supersession of both Judaism and Christianity. And Maimonides sought, among other people in his period, but he was the greatest, to, to explain how Judaism is unique and different, and in his eyes, superior to Christianity and to Islam. So the philosophic tradition uh, gives birth to a theology uh, of Judaism that becomes foundational for future generations. Um, in addition to his work on Jewish law, Yad HaHazaka or the Mishneh Torah, Maimonides is internationally known for a book known as the Guide for the Perplexed. And this is a philosophic work where he again sets the foundations of Jewish philosophic theology. What is it about Judaism that makes it intellectually cogent, coherent, and appropriate? And what he tries to do in the Guide for the Perplexed is to synthesize the Torah teachings with the philosophy of Aristotle. Aristotelianism was a great intellectual strand uh, in the Middle Ages, eventually to be uh, in competition with uh, Platonism and Neo, I mean, Neoplatonism in the Middle Ages, but Aristotle was a firm, I mean, Maimonides was a firm Aristotelian. And he agreed with Aristotle down the line on everything philosophic except on one point. And here he sided with Torah rather than philosophy. Maimonides believed not in an eternal universe, but in a created universe in order to, uh, in his mind, be truthful to the teachings of the Torah. So uh, if we have to highlight a name from the Middle Ages, um, that would be Maimonides. There are many other names that uh, are influential. Maimonides becomes influential not only in Jewish thought, but in Christian philosophic theology. Thomas Aquinas, the 16th century Christian Catholic theologian quotes Maimonides profusely and refers to him in his writings as Rabbi Moses, as Rabbi Moses would teach. Uh, so his influence was, uh, was universal and also in Islamic tradition. And there was a lot of sharing among these different philosophic strands, each trying to use philosophy to affirm its theological convictions. Another name that is important to uh, take note of during the Middle Ages, not in the Sephardic tradition now, but in the Ashkenazi tradition, is a prominent biblical and Talmudic interpreter that we know as Rashi. Rashi are the initials for Rabbi Solomon, son of Isaac. 
Rabbi Solomon, son of Isaac, lived in the uh, in uh, France, uh, uh, in the area of Troyes, and uh, he was the to go to interpreter of the biblical tradition. If you go to a yeshiva, to an Orthodox uh, rabbinical uh, seminary, uh, or even pre-rabbinical seminary, because Rashi studied from elementary school on, you don't just learn Torah. You learn Torah with Rashi. How does Rashi interpret the Torah? That becomes kind of the, the strand. And Rashi becomes an important consolidator also of, of Midrashic traditions, of Talmudic traditions, which he quotes in his commentaries. Uh, the study of Rashi is uh, an essential part of the training of a traditional Jewish literacy. <clears throat> uh, there were many other great thinkers. There were biblical interpreters in Spain, going back uh, to, to Spain. And uh, we have Rabbi uh, Moses Ibn Ezra. Moses Ibn Ezra was also a biblical interpreter. His bent was more philological, linguistic. His observations precede much of what we know about modern philology by looking at the biblical text. Uh, there's, there's even a little heterodoxy to uh, uh, Ibn Ezra because he deigns to suggest that perhaps Moses did not write to the entire Torah uh, as he studies the closing chapters of the book of Deuteronomy and, um, he, uh, and other passages of the Bible. So uh, much more to learn about it. Philosophy, a key strand of medieval Judaism. The prayer book, which had existed primarily in oral tradition, becomes now consolidated. Written versions of the prayer book begin to emerge. And it's not just one tradition, various traditions, uh, but all having a common core that goes back to the rabbinic period. Uh, as we had philosophy and as we had halakha, the practice, uh, the, the, the actual practice of Judaism, there emerged during the Middle Ages mystical expressions of Judaism. The overarching term for this is Kabbalah. The word Kabbalah comes to mean uh, the received tradition, but the received secret tradition. So Kabbalah is considered um, an esoteric that is a, a hidden tradition that is transmitted only from master to disciple and only in a time when the disciple is ready to understand it. And the source of Kabbalah, even though it has early rabbinic sources uh, in Midrash and in Talmud, the main source of Kabbalah is a book known as the Zohar, which is a mystical commentary of the, uh, of the Torah and eventually of other books of the Bible. And again, its origins are in Spain in the 13th century. And the, the book of the Zohar spawns many other mystical uh, movements in Judaism. And uh, Jewish mysticism will flourish uh, uh, among the Jews who leave Spain and settle in the northern part of the land of Israel, the Galilee, especially in the city of Safed in the 16th century. And the great exponent of, of this period of mysticism is a uh, teacher by the name of Rabbi Isaac Luria. And Rabbi Isaac Luria, known as the Ari, uh, which is a, a initials of his name, but also the word Ari stands for the lion. Uh, he is the exponent of mystical approaches to Judaism. Another great exponent of Jewish mysticism is the man uh, who also compiles one of the most famous codes of Jewish law, Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yosef Karo, again in the 16th century in, uh, in Northern Israel, compiles a book known as the Shulchan Aruch. It's not a book, it's a collection. It's a tome, a tomes which outline the practices of Jewish law. And this becomes foundational for Sephardic Jews. Then a commentary is written on top 
of Cairo's um, code known as the Mapa by Rabbi Moses Isserlis, which makes the book now applicable to Ashkenazi communities in Europe. So the Ashkenazi world and the Sephardic world are different, but they coexist. Some customs vary from community to community, melodies, dress, religious practice, <clears throat> and yet they intersect with one another. And I mentioned Rabbi Yosef Caro because in addition to being a compiler of a code of Jewish law, he's one of the great mystics in the Jewish tradition. In many religious traditions, mysticism and legal traditions do not go with one another. The mystics are the antinomians, those who are against the legal aspects of the tradition. In Judaism, there seems to be a greater coexistence and reciprocity between <clears throat> the mystical and the halachic uh, or the um, legal uh, practice tradition of, uh, of the faith and the culture. Uh, that gives us a, um, a kind of a survey of what happens in the Middle Ages. Prayer book traditions are consolidated, codes of law are promulgated, philosophy and philology uh, achieve uh, great heights. Jewish mysticism begins to uh, grab hold of the faithful in times, especially of, of persecution and displacement. And there was a lot of that in the Middle Ages. Repeated persecutions and massacres of Jews uh, in, in the Christian world. These happened in the Rhinelands, Rhinelands in the 11th century. The Crusades begin in the year 1040. And while the Crusades were an effort on the part of Christendom to uh, take the Holy Land away from the Muslim infidels, so it was a, a fight between Christianity and Islam, Jews lived in the midst of Europe. And as the Crusaders <clears throat> traveled to the Holy Land to fight the Muslim infidels there, they said, look, there are infidels among us. Why do we have to wait until we get there? So Jewish communities throughout Europe suffer the consequences of this period of fanaticism uh, that begins to combine religion and politics in such an unhealthy way. Um, there is a massacre of the Jews of, the, of York in England in the year 1190. Uh, there are uh, persecutions of the Jews of, of Navarre. Uh, uh, the foundations of the Inquisition are set in Spain in 1391. And this initiates a century of persecutions against the Jews in Christian Spain that will eventuate with the establishment of the Inquisition, the uh, forced conversion of Jews, or the expulsion of Jews who fail to uh, take the oath of Christianity. And that happens in 1492, uh, when by different estimates, uh, 100,000 Jews left Spain. Uh, a good number of them settled in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, others went to uh, France and to Italy, uh, Holland countries that would accept them. Some settled in Northern Africa. And uh, eventually some of these Jews, especially Jews who had gone from Spain to Portugal in order to seek asylum in Portugal, but then were subjected to the Inquisition there four years after when the Prince of Portugal wanted to marry the Princess of Spain and the Spanish monarchs demanded of the King of Portugal that he also impose the Inquisition. So Jews tried to begin to leave. There had already been Jews that came to the Americas during the period of the discoveries, but then there was a great trickle of Jews into the, American, into the Americas in the 15th century. My own origins, uh, is of Spanish Portuguese Jews um, uh, that had left Spain in 1492 or who then went to Portugal and eventually started to trickle out and then went to Holland, Italy, eventually to uh, even to the Ottoman Empire. My 
My great grandfather on my mother's side was a rabbi in Turkey, but uh, others came directly to the Americas and settled primarily in South America, what was Brazil then, until they had to leave, uh, because first it was Dutch and the Dutch allowed Jews to live there, but then it became Portuguese and the Jews had to leave whenever the Portuguese or the Spaniards took over. <clears throat> settled in the Caribbean uh, and eventually came to North America. The first official settlement of Jews in North America is in 1654 in New Amsterdam of Jews escaping the Inquisition in South America uh, uh, that settle just 23 in number in New Amsterdam to the great chagrin of the then governor of New Amsterdam, um, Stuyvesant, Peter Stuyvesant, uh, who had already had contacts with Jews when he was the governor uh, or the, uh, of the island of Curacao. To this day, the oldest continuously existent Jewish community in the Americas is in the island of Curacao. And the oldest existing synagogue is there and it dates to 1732. The oldest existing Jewish community under the American flag is in the island of St. Thomas. And my family stems for both St. Thomas and Curacao. They settled in Central America and that how it's, that's how it happened that I was born in Panama. Uh, I am a, a Jew of Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, uh, Caribbean ancestry. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of living history. Um, Judaism, the Middle Ages begin to close uh, as a result of developments that are taking place in Europe and the Americas, and we call those developments modernity. And it is associated with two developments, one intellectual and one political. The intellectual we call the enlightenment, the political we call the birth of democracy. So let me stop there for a few moments and see if there are any uh, comments or clarifications or questions. Hi, right, just a quick question about um, events during the medieval period of uh, Judaism. I read somewhere that the um, division of the Torah into weekly portions was developed during, during the medieval period. Is that true? And who did that? I think it would be uh, difficult to establish exactly when it was developed. If it, I would say that it was in the late uh, rabbinic period. Okay. Uh, and it was divided in two different types of reading emerge. One is the cyclical reading of the Torah and the practices differed in Babylonia and in the land of Israel. In Babylonia, the cycle took one year. In the land of Israel, it took three years. So this was, this was still in the stages of, of what we can call rabbinic Judaism, the academies in Babylonia, the academies in, in the land of Israel, northern Israel especially. Uh, the parallel development was as Jews in different places and circumstances were prohibited from the actual study of the Torah, they found refuge in fight in developing readings from the books of the prophets as readings that would correspond to the messages of the Torah. And that's how the practice of, in addition to the weekly Torah reading, adding a passage known as the Haftarah, which is taken from the books, from a chapter from the books of the prophets. So there are two uh, readings that take place on the Sabbath in the synagogue, the weekly Torah portion, and the weekly Haftarah portion. The Haftarah is from one of the books of the prophets, a selection from the book of the prophets that has some correspondence with the weekly Torah reading. Now, what many congregations have done in modern times is kind of do an adaptation of the Babylonian and the, and the land of Israel traditions. Uh, it, because instead of reading the entire portion 
every Sabbath, which would allow us to complete the Torah in one year, we read one third of each weekly Torah portion. And um, so for example, we read the first third in the first year cycle, the second third in the second year cycle, the third in the, in the third year cycle, but moving from portion to portion from week to week. So we get through the cycle of Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, but we don't read everything in it. We come back to it the next year and read another third and then the third year, uh, a different third. But we finish it every year. Uh, the holiday of Simchat Torah is a uh, later rabbinic uh, practice, in fact, to commemorate the uh, festivities of completing the cycle of Torah reading. That was um, established in Babylonia where it was uh, already the custom to observe uh, some holidays as two days holidays. Uh, when you become a little bit more familiar with the Jewish calendar, you understand that Simchat Torah corresponds in the traditional calendar to the second day of Shmini Atzeret, which is the closure of the festival of Sukkot. In many modern congregations today, Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah are observed jointly on one day. In Orthodox and some conservative congregations, it's two days, one of Shemini Atzeret and one of Simchat Torah, which would be the second day of Shemini Atzeret. Yes, good question. Any other questions or comments? Okay, interesting to note also that the cycle of Haftorah readings um, sometimes differs among the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi Jews. So there's a great deal of room for diversity uh, and heterogeneity within the tradition. Um, we can have unity with, uh, with diversity. Okay, who wants to tell me what what is modernity? When you hear the word modernity, what comes to mind? What is modern? And takers? I would say ideas of uh, democracy and uh, ideas of uh, uh, freedom and uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what else? Like uh, industrialization and uh, the sort of development of what we think of as capitalism today. There's different, uh, uh, different economic system, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're breaking down the old structures. Yeah, anything else? What do you mean by modern art, for example? We use the expression modern art. The idea of individualism. Yeah, the centrality of, of the individual. So in many ways, what we call modernity has many strands. It has to do uh, <clears throat> with the breakdown of the static forms that we identified with the Middle Ages, with the conformity, uh, with, the with the rule of uh, nobilities and church and uh, the existence of the existence of uh, individuals who were subservient to those entities, the the breakdown of authority, both political and intellectual, the rejection of certain ways of thinking, the birth of reason that gives way to an industrialization to ways of uh, engaging in, uh, in, in uh, transactions that eventually yield to capitalism and intellectually the emergence of an ideology of human equality, right? The emphasis on the individual human being as opposed to the collective only and the rule however hesitantly of democracy over authority and whether that be monarchical or church authority. 
So it was a, a, it was a, a period of great change and periods of great change often bring about turmoil. And turmoil is often directed at certain groups that are identified as culprits or blamed for uh, certain developments. So in the middle of the 1700s, the 18th century, we begin to see the birth of modernity, democracy, what we call the enlightenment in Europe. Um, for Jews, this meant that they could now acquire citizenship in the countries where they had once been relegated to a different collective identity that wasn't part of the classical structures of church, nobility, or serfs. Jews were like a fourth category. In some places they were tolerated, at other times and in different places they were persecuted, but they were at the mercy of whoever the ruler was, whether the church or secular rulers. And in most cases, there was a coalition between the church and the secular rulers of Europe. Um, so modernity with its promise of individualism, of freedom, of access to educational institutions for Jews, Jews begin to be able to attend universities, to enter certain professions, to participate in certain um, aspects of general society, this becomes very attractive uh, to some Jews. Other more traditionalist Jews are very suspect of it and reject it. And let us remember that when we talk about enlightenment and democracy at this time, we're talking primarily about Western Europe, not yet Eastern Europe, the domain of the czar, the domain of uh, still a, an authoritarian structure. And there were significant numbers of Jews living there, Ashkenazi Jews who had migrated from Central Europe <laughs> to Poland and to, uh, and to uh, uh, Russia, areas that would become eventually the Soviet Union. But in Central Europe, in Germany, in Czechoslovakia, in France, uh, Jews begin to see a new horizon of possibility. And um, the majority of Jews embrace this new possibility. And with the development of the general enlightenment, there emerges a Jewish enlightenment. Now, many Jews choose to flow into the European enlightenment and divest themselves of their Jewishness. They want to become fully Europeanized. And in fact, the birthings of modern anti-Semitism force many into that because the, the movement that opened the doors for Jews and other minorities to enter Western society brought in its heels a movement of rejection to that as well. So even though democracy is the birth, sees its birth in the Enlightenment, modern anti-Semitism also sees its birth in this same period. And uh, there is resistance to the Jewish influ influx into Western society, into the professions, into government, into the economy. Wait a minute, you're supposed to stand at the back of the line. Um, and yet many Jews began to move to the front of the line with the opportunities. You know, what, what would we think of Europe uh, without, um, uh, without the music of Felix Mendelssohn or the psychology of, uh, of uh, Sigmund Freud. Freud. Uh, and uh, so this was all made possible by the Enlightenment, yet many people rejected that. And, the, and modern anti-Semitism sees its birth at the same time as the Enlightenment begins to flourish. The very term anti-Semitism is a term that is coined uh, in the uh, 
19th century to, to indicate that antipathy to Jews, not now necessarily and only as a religious community, but as a racial community. So racial anti-Semitism begins to find um, ground in Europe, in England, in Germany. The tragedy will eventuate in the 20th century when these teachings are applied in systematic fashion to lead to the uh, elimination of European Jewry. But the foundation was set by 1800 years of religious anti-Semitism to see the Jew as an other, to see the Jew as an outsider, one who could not be integrated into Western society. And then when that began to happen, there was a rejection of that. Um, and that is the double-edged sword of the enlightenment for Jews in Europe. Yes, uh, Martine, I see your hand. I just wanted to add also the idea of another another way of leading the community to, to not be uh, victims of uh, anti-Semitism has been uh, the assimilation. A, a, lo a lot of Jews in the French Empire, during the French Empire and after, during the colonization of South Africa, they opt for the assimilation very strongly. Well, I that was, thank you for raising that because that's where we are going next. What happens, what happens in this period? And I said, some Jews use the enlightenment to flow out of Judaism. Others use it to cultivate Jewish learning. And uh, so modern Jewish literature, uh, uh, the rebirth of the Hebrew language, the uh, birth of Zionism takes place as a result of these opportunities and their challenges. Um, Zionism is a very interesting phenomenon because it develops intellectually in France as a result of anti-Semitic activity against the Jews. Theodore Herzl, who himself was on the verge of conversion to Christianity, realizes that the Jews don't have a future in European society as it is presently construed. And he decides that the future of Judaism is in the reaffirmation, not just of Jewish religion, but of Jewish nationalism and a return to the land of the ancestors. Uh, and this gives birth to, uh, to a whole new way of thinking about modern Jewish identity. Because in, in the trend in Europe had been to become European Jews. And that gave birth to the modern religious movements that we know today as reform, orthodox, conservative Judaism. Reconstructionism will be born in the United States out of the conservative movement primarily, but kind of as an umbrella uh, movement. So in Europe, we have two directions, perhaps three. Jews who flow out of Judaism simply to assimilate completely into Western society. Jews who own the ideas of the enlightenment to cultivate and develop a new form of Judaism in conformity to modern intellectual, social European standards. And that gives birth to reform, modern Orthodox and conservative Judaism and nationalism, the birth of Zionism as an intellectual movement. Now, Intellectually, Zionism is born in Central Europe. The practical application of it comes primarily from Eastern European Jews who are still suffering under the Tsar and who own the badge of Jewish culture and nationalism uh, in order to find their way uh, to modernity. And that's where the flow, the primary flow of Jews to the uh, to the land of Israel, which was then under the Ottoman Empire, begins to take place. There were always Jews living in the land of Israel, but the immigrations of the late 19th century, of the birth of the organized <coughs> uh, Zionist movement, uh, begin to set the foundations for what will be uh, the 1948 establishment of the state of Israel. 
Uh, and that is a whole chapter uh, unto itself. Uh, what does all this mean for the history of uh, the Middle East and for Jews in that part? We'll come to that separately. So modernity is confusing. Uh, Christine uh, Martin referred to uh, assimilation. Felix Mendelssohn, whom I mentioned earlier, was baptized a Christian upon birth by his father, Abraham. Abraham was the son of Moses Mendelssohn, the greatest Jewish philosopher of modernity, who sought to find, he was kind of the Maimonides of modernity. He sought to find a way to reconcile being a modern person and being a Jew, a Jew in modernity. His major work is called Jerusalem, and it was an effort to reconcile modernity with Judaism. And he lived a pious, orthodox Jewish life, but in the context of modernity. He translated the Bible into German for Jews to read, but he wrote it in Hebrew characters so that they could read it, okay? Like Yiddish, Yiddish is, but it wasn't Yiddish. This was modern German that he translated. He wrote philosophic works. He wrote political treatises. And his aim was to create a coexistence between Judaism and Europeanism. His grandchild already was a Christian because the family felt that Christianity was the passport to Western society. Another famous example, Heinrich Heine, the great mm -hmm. German poet, mm -hmm. who writes that my conversion to Christianity is simply my passport to European society. They didn't abdicate Judaism because they didn't want to be Jewish. They abdicated Judaism because they couldn't be part of European society in the way that they envisioned it by remaining Jewish. Now, this was a period of, of turmoil. It was a period of adjustment. And there are sources that adduce to this in the um, materials that you can access uh, online uh, after we finish our session today. In France, the process of incorporation of Jews into French nationhood was done during the period of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And before granting the Jews citizenship, nationality. Mm -hmm. that's right, nationality, he gathered an assembly of notables, of leading Jews, and posed to them certain questions, kind of a proof. It, they have to prove their, the readiness of the Jewish community to accept French nationhood and pledge their loyalty only to the French state and abandon certain practices that were um, under the supervision of a internal Jewish civil law. So you had to be a Jew by religion, but a French by nationality. And there couldn't be any conflict between the two. In many ways, what we today understand by religious diversity in America. Uh, in France, the issue of laicite, les of, uh, of secularism, mm -hmm. state is secular, religion is here, the state is here. In the United States, even though we have separation of church and state, we fudge it a little bit more. Certain things wouldn't go in France that go here. Uh, for example, the French state considers it appropriate to prohibit the use of certain garments that are distinctive of faith in public places or certainly in governmental places. Uh, and there's a great deal of zeal uh, not to breach that separation. Um, and this has caused a lot of problems in contemporary French society to the Muslims that live there who are still going through in many ways, the Muslim society in France is going through certain of the uh, steps that Jews went through 200 years ago uh, in acculturating themselves to European society. Um, 
So that is the story of modernity. And that brings us to modern America, um, where we live under the freedoms that uh, were birthed by the Enlightenment. Who is the great philosopher of the Enlightenment in Europe before, before the political Enlightenment really began to take hold? Oh, we have Voltaire. Voltaire? Yes. And many people will say Locke. Locke. Locke, yeah. But, before, but you cannot leave out a man by the name of Spinoza. Spinoza, mm -hmm. but okay. it's way before. Of mm -hmm. course, Spinoza is before. And Spinoza lays the foundation for what will become the secular state. He was in his own generation misunderstood and persecuted and ostracized and uh, anathematized, but he is the great thinker of modernity. And who was Spinoza? A Dutch Jew. A Jewish, a Jewish, yeah. Lived in Amsterdam, a descendant of Jews that had been expelled from Spain and Portugal in 1492. He, he, he was a contemporary of Descartes. And uh, the clear minding uh, reason for not only uh, modern politics, but interpretation of religion. He rejected a supernaturalist understanding of religion. He declared that the Torah could not have been written by Moses. It was early stages of biblical uh, critical analysis, scientific analysis of the Bible before even the tools were available. So Spinoza is behind, sometimes overtly, sometimes silently, the developments that we know as the Enlightenment, democracy. Jefferson, his library contained the complete works of Spinoza. So in many ways, American society, American democracy, as we have come to know it, was influenced by the writings of this Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch Jew. So that's a little bit of the influence. We will come to study um, uh, the birth of Zionism uh, a little bit later as we study contemporary Jewish community. But it should be mentioned at this point that the movements that we identify as the current trends in modern Judaism, American Judaism, are birthed in the 19th century, 1800s, what we call Reform Judaism, modern orthodoxy, conservative Judaism. They all emerge as a result of the Enlightenment and the need of the Jews of Europe to find ways of living their Judaism in a society that accepted them as Jews in the open society. And yet they wanted to retain expressions of Judaism that were identifiable, but did not violate the norms of democracy and the open society. So the first movement, the first effort is known as Reform Judaism. Reform Judaism was an effort to adapt traditional Judaism to the open, contemporary, uh, newly birthing, democratic, intellectual society. And what did Reform Judaism, which started in uh, Central Europe, especially took ground in Germany, what did it do? Well, it tried to adapt Jewish practice, primarily begins with practice, adapt Jewish practice to, the, to how religion was understood in European society. So much of early reformed Jewish practice was adapted from Lutheran Christianity. The introduction of an organ to the synagogue, the dressing of the rabbis in black robes to look like clergy, the abbreviation of the liturgy, the vernacularization of the, of the language of prayer, meaning praying not only in Hebrew, but in German, or in France, it would be in French, and so forth. 
bringing the religious practice to greater contemporaneity in order to retain the loyalty of the younger generation and also to appeal and to appear more legitimate in the face of the open society. So the reform movement minimized certain Jewish observances. It minimized the Hebrew component of the prayer uh, service. It in, in time abandoned the dietary laws. You wanna live in modern society? You know, Jewish dietary laws make it difficult to sit down with your uh, Christian friends in a restaurant or in their homes and share a meal. So these were interpreted as expressions of Judaism of a bygone age. The elimination of certain dress codes, uh, making Judaism more contemporaneous. The response to reform Judaism was modern orthodoxy, an effort to retain as much of the traditional practice and yet allow us to participate fully in the social, political, and economic realms of Western society, but maintain a fuller level of observance. Hebrew in the prayers, uh, dietary laws, the observance of the Sabbath, these were key to orthodoxy. Adherence to Jewish law, seeing Jewish, seeing Talmudic law as, as permanently valid. You can interpret it, you can adapt it, but you don't reject it. Reform Judaism rejected it. And then in the middle of reform and modern orthodoxy, there emerges a third movement, which was known it's in, early in its earlier manifestations as positive historical Judaism, and eventually becomes conservative Judaism. And the great teachers, the great founders of these movements are European. These move, conservative Judaism was more of a synthesis between reform and orthodox. Retain practice, but at the same time, uh, participate more fully in Western uh, society and in Western learning. And interestingly, the founders of each of these movements in Germany, the Reform, the Orthodox, the Conservative, were colleagues and they knew one another and they often studied, but they went in different directions. So the movements as we know them today came to America as the European immigration begins to come to this country. Reform Judaism came in the early stages with the German immigrants. The institutions of the reform movement were established in the United States uh, in the mid 1800s. And the, the seat of much of reform Judaism became the Midwest. Cincinnati is the heart of the early reform Jew, uh, movement in this country. The rabbinical seminary, the Hebrew Union College is located there. And early reformed Jews, which were for the most German Jews or Central European Jews that came to this country, found in America a kind of a, a, a new Zion. And many thought that their version of Judaism would appeal not only to Jews in this country, but to non-Jews. And Isaac Mayer Wise, the founder of reformed Judaism in this country, thought that his version of Judaism would become the religion of Americans. By the way, the Unitarians thought the same thing. The Unitarians, uh, the Emersonians uh, thought the same thing. And then uh, different migrations brought Jews from different parts. Uh, Eastern European Jews came, they brought stronger forms of orthodoxy. They had already come uh, with some German Jews, European Orthodoxy, but now Eastern European Orthodoxy, uh, and then uh, the conservative uh, movement in America was an effort against the synthesized reform and orthodoxy. Um, the early founders of the conservative movement in America, many of them were connected with the early reform movement in America. But when the early reform movement went a little bit too much uh, 
to the left in their estimation. They then founded the institutions that would give birth to the conservative movement in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And they brought a great European scholar, Solomon Schechter, to lead uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary and uh, thus were established the foundations of what would become the conservative movement in the United States. One of the disciples of Solomon Schechter was Mordecai Kaplan. And in the 1930s, 20s, 30s, 40s, Kaplan began to lay the foundations of what would become eventually Reconstructionist Judaism in this country. Eastern Europeans immigrations brought different forms of orthodoxy, Hasidic Judaism. And uh, so the Orthodox world, even though it's the smallest segment of American Judaism, is internally the most diverse segment of American Judaism. There are many different strands of orthodoxy. What? Yes, any questions? Yes, uh, my question is, um, and it's gonna be a bit uh, on the side. I, I often was asked by my students, so the Jews, is a race to be a race, you know, like not like being a race, like uh, you have all kind of race uh, in this world. And I was, I'm always very, I, I cannot find really a good explanation to let them know that there is not a, such a thing that a Jewish race. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always puzzled because I, I, I want to be very, prudent, you know, very... Uh... Sure. Well, so, the best answer to are the Jews a race is to... Uh, are the Jews a race, exactly. The yes, best exactly. answer is send your it, questioner to the land of Israel and tell them to look at the diversity of Jews uh, in the land of Israel, right? You have. That's Jews. what I said, but yeah, I, I, I answer that. I say, you know, if you go to Israel, you will see blonde, blue eyes, and you know, all the stereotype physically and all that comes down right away. Right. But that idea of uh, of rest. There's a book right. that I would recommend that you can uh, okay offer. It's called The Myth of the Jewish Race. Okay, good, good. By a uh, Israeli uh, famous anthropologist. His name is Raphael. Patai, P A, I think two T's, A I, Patai, P A T T A I or P A T A I, Raphael Patai. Now, Could the you other thing is remember Raphael Patai, the myth. No, no, the name of the, of, of the book, The Myth of the Jewish Race. The Myth of the Jewish Race. Remember okay. that the concept of Judaism as race is a modern concept invented by anti Semites. Right, right, right. So mm -hmm. the, the whole concept of race uh, is, is suspect. Uh, the, what we say today is race is really not verifiable in any, in, in any significant way across the board. Originally, when linguists, when, when the term race was first used, it was a linguistic concept, different linguistic strands. The word race was applied to linguistics, not to phenotypes, not to, not to, not to physiological types. Um, in their mythology of modern racial theory, um, European eugenicists and, uh, and uh, um, ultranationalists invented the concept of race and applied it to, to uh, physical uh, characteristics of people. Uh, but essentially the human race is fundamentally equal, uniform, biologically uh, as, as uh, 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 it just has different manifestations. So you might wanna talk about ethnicities, cultures, traditions, geographic origins, um, but the term race is generally used in pejorative ways. And we should keep that in mind of anybody who asks the question. Um, but there is diversity among the Jewish 
people. So when you ask, what people are asking are, are you a race? Are you all the same? No. First of all, there is diversity. Go to the land of Israel or even in this country. But here we are smaller and we're more um, uh, absorbed into the general population. And the majority of American Jews are of uh, European or Eastern European ancestry. So they're, uh, you know, light skinned. Uh, but Jewish people have come from India, from North Africa, from uh, from, uh, from Ethiopia, from uh, Scandinavia, from Central Europe, from Eastern Europe, from Spain. So a panoply diversity. That's what the book by Patai will illustrate very clearly. Yeah, and I don't want to abuse the time for all, really I don't want to abuse that. But there was also the question of, at time I was asked, so wh which tribe are you coming from? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it is, but I have to face I mean, that. It, it, it's it, it's uh, based on the notion. Some people who take the Bible so seriously that they think that Jews today are descendants of a particular tribe, and we can and we can trace it. Most likely, most Jews today are descendants of the tribe of Judah, because that is the tribe that that was the largest one and survived, uh, and it was it was the population of. Uh, what is called Judea by the Romans that was, uh, you know, overcome and destroyed in the first century of the common era and Jews were dispersed. But there were Jews outside of the land of Israel before then. So there was diversity before then. But it's, it would be very difficult. Uh, I don't know that there are genealogical studies that could do that to trace ancestry to different tribes. Some have done studies trying to link themselves to the Levite tribe, that, that they are Kohanim, descendants of the priests, that would be the Levite tribe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, there are Levites among the Jewish community by ancestry, because the Levites lived dispersed among different populations of Jews. And certainly there were Levites in Judea in the land. And so there are members of the tribe of Levi, a certain, certain families of whom are Kohanim, priests, but the priesthood as a functional category ceased to exist in Judaism in the first century of the common era. Thank you so much. That really helps. Thank okay, you. I think that we are at uh, closing time. Um, I'd like to remind you of two important events and spread the word. Tomorrow evening at seven o'clock, we are co-sponsoring with the Jewish Community Center and in uh, under the sponsorship of the uh, Eli Lilly Foundation, uh, the Indiana inaugural of a, of a video of a documentary on the life and teachings of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, okay. Spiritual Audacity. This will be something that will not only inform you and instruct you, but deeply move you and alert you to important intellectual strands in, Jew in American life that have helped to shape the Jewish community today. Uh, we are engaging in conversation, the um, director, producer of the film, um, and also Susanna Heschel, the daughter of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who is a professor of Jewish studies at Dartmouth uh, University. So please join us for that. Tomorrow you can access uh, the information from our website. And then next Monday night, we have our ongoing series, Cocktail Judaism, and we're going to be talking about a mental health uh, uh, issues in, um, in contemporary Jewish and general society. And uh, uh, that is um, a week from this Monday. So two Mondays to stay engaged. I think we skip next Sunday and then pick up again on November 7th, if my calendar is correct. Um, anything that I need to know or say, uh, Jackie, thank you for keeping us connected. That sounds great. Okay. Well, thank you all. And uh, thank you. see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week, everyone. You too. It's a little foggy out there, but um, <laughs> we will be able to get out a little bit. And yeah. just a reminder, all of the recordings are housed on our YouTube channel if you want to look back. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Sunday.
Thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you.